So, well, this gives us, uh, this panel gives us an uh, opportunity to hear a little bit more from each of the scientists we heard about, um, especially the themes that may have come up that were overarching. Um, we certainly heard uh, some very similar stories um, having to do with how uh, species really have overcome some of those barriers to migration. Um, so what we'll do is uh, I'll start maybe with a question for the whole panel to, to answer, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, one, of, one of the thoughts I had since I sort of started the session with two reasons why species don't migrate, don't disperse often from the, the places where they're native is um, because they're adapted to the place that they live. Um, the other reason being that they, they can't get around all that easily. You guys have shown through human aids how species have moved into different places and are becoming problematic. If we look at now the changes in habitat that might actually allow species to move into new environments, um, I'm speaking mostly about global warming, we're seeing ranges change because what was previously uninhabitable to I wonder if you could speak to, within your own groups, how, how that might be affecting animals and plants. What, what's uh, really fortunate for the wall lizards is they're, they're this, the group that we have are uh, in north central Italy, and they can handle cold climate, so they can freeze 28% of their body water and still survive. But they can also handle hot conditions as well, so they, it's a Mediterranean climate, and it's pretty much like we have here. So for the wall lizards specifically, they were almost pretty adapted for our climate, so it was very fortuitous that they landed here. Um, there are also populations of wall lizards in uh, Kansas, Cincinnati, New Jersey. Uh, I think there was one in Philadelphia, and I think it's wiped out. But there's also a population down in California, so uh, they're finding nice little pockets in North America where they do very well. Climate warming, climate change will probably augment that, so uh, we can expect further spread in British Columbia. Well, we, we certainly we certainly see that in uh, in hydroids because uh, well take 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 the uh, Galapagos for example right uh, you have increased transport and you have increased opportunities for spread and, and I didn't have time to go into that but at the same time uh, you 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 do have potential uh, with there are two things you and you have potential with increased um, artificial artificial uh, structures and, and more uh, uh, anthropogenic material on the shoreline, you have more opportunities to generate substrates for which organisms, by which organisms can spread. Now, the, now with, 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 with changing climate, what you have are uh, the temperature gradients start to change. So you have warmer waters up north, and we see that in our record. We see, we see uh, hydrates, for example, uh, previously found in, in warmer waters, uh, we now record them uh, further up north because they're the, because uh, of, of changes in temperature and the following that gradient. So you do, you see things like that. Uh, so taken together, the, those are those are pretty uh, significant components of uh, spread of invasive species. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I mentioned a little paper that I'm writing with uh, six other people about. Dragonflies moving north into the Arctic, and the we don't have any you know clear and detailed temperature data with respect to these movements, but the obvious conclusion is that because dragonflies have never been found or seen before in some of these places in the Arctic Islands, for example, Banks Island or uh, certainly Herschel Island, just off the north coast of the Yukon. Uh, is, is experiencing um, a lot more dragonfly records in the last few years than in decades previously. And because, as Henry mentioned, the further north you go, the more f strongly some of these uh, temperature changes seem to be felt, it seems clear that dragonflies at least are m moving north uh, in response to warm climate. Um, the, the down to fly that Russ found in the Okanagan. Now, we don't know if that's, uh, that movement is due to, to climate warming, but it could be. Uh, the, the movements aren't all that uh, 
huge. Uh, you know, the, the, the species has moved from southern Washington State to British Columbia, you know, over a decade, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, but it's moving, and uh, so we, we might assume that it's got something to do with its temperature, since these insects are very um, susceptible to temperature changes and, and so on. Uh, in some dragonflies, uh, the uh, movement might be associated with more aquatic habitats being developed by human beings. In the Okanagan, lots and lots of marshes have been destroyed by humans, but new ones or new ponds or new little uh, wet spots have been created. And this is true uh, uh, in a study I did on, on, uh, on prairies with uh, a different kind of dragonfly, which seems to be moving north, not necessarily strictly because of temperature change, but because uh, more and more habitats are being created for its breeding uh, possibilities. Anyway, dragonflies as a, as a particular group of insects seems to, seem to be moving and moving northward uh, they're very, a lot of the species are very able to move quite quickly because they're strong flyers. Um, and so uh, climate change seems to have some kind of impact on their, their populations at least. I have a, my own microphone. <laughs> um, I guess the only thing I'd add is in invasions, there's actually the opportunity a lot of the time for a lot of animals to get transported to a new area. Whether or not it truly becomes invasive is often limited by what it can reproduce. Um, and that's usually related to temperature and salinity. So with warming oceans, that sort of thing, it's just going to mean that we have more invaders and more opportunities for them to be able to reproduce and spread and that sort of thing. So yes, it's going to have a big factor. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions from the floor? Yes. I was interested in what processes are in place to convey some of the findings around invasive species to the government. So basically, uh, how do we convey the science to policymakers? Uh, I'm specifically myself. I'm part of an interministry invasive species working group, and when I say interministry, it's transport, tourism, parks, Canada. Uh, sometimes fisheries and oceans are part of the group. Um, Ministry of Environment, Forest, Science, Natural Resources, and Roman, I can't remember exactly what their acronym stands for. But um, we're actually museum content, I'm sort of the funnel through to that, that committee that's province wide and with and it's it's got its own reach federally as well. So that's one one of the avenues that this museum is actually getting information out to the larger audience and the policymakers. So a lot of us, um, a lot of us are involved in, with with various uh, various uh, invasive species management groups, and um, we go out and talk about uh, and talk about these uh, various groups that we're working on and, and uh, strategies for management uh, and, and so on. So that that's one way of getting the, the information out, um, as far as you know, hopefully affecting policy level uh, at, at some stage. Uh, and uh, we're also involved um, at another level, more directly, um, in terms of uh, working through uh, through federal agencies, um, uh, for example, uh, with projects on not only mapping um, different invasive species um, and, and indigenous species, because because in order to, to understand one, you have to understand the other. So we're working on, at that level, for example. To, to not only map them um, and to do our research, but also uh, to put that data together in such a way that this, this data is no longer localized, but it's shared across platforms and different agencies uh, and, and, and different people and, um, and affecting change from there. So that's the like two ways in which we, we do that. Although I've worked with uh, invasive species myself in the past, None of the species I mentioned this morning are, could be considered invasive. They're moving, but uh, at least two of them, of course, were uh, native species. The, the little fly from Europe could become invasive. We have no idea, but at the moment it certainly doesn't look like it is. Um, 
the the people in, in the provincial government that I've dealt mainly with in my career, although I'm retired now, I still deal with them. Uh, this is the Conservation Data Center in the Ministry of the Environment. And they deal with endangered species and habitats rather than invasive ones, although they, they certainly are interested in invasive species if they might cause additional uh, stress on, uh, on rare native species. Um, for instance, the robber fly that I discussed, that's appeared in Vernon and first uh, um, found uh, last summer is quite clearly a rare species and uh, may be considered a, as a, as a um, species of interest with, with uh, the conservation data center. And federally, the equivalent uh, so organization is CASILIC, the, uh, the Committee on the uh, Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, which I spent a lot of time uh, um, dealing with too. And they are interested in uh, animals and plants that uh, are rare and need to be pursued, need to be conserved, and of course, invasive species may or may not uh, affect uh, any of the species that they're uh, interested in as well. So it's all it's all part of a a, uh, a network, as as uh, my colleagues have said, of people keeping in touch with everyone and making sure that that these changes are documented. Uh, so yeah, we share by actually a lot of our times our co-authors or um, these government agencies, you just heard that. Um, but people do also know that we are a data center as well. So for example, the CDC will contact me and say, hey, is there any updated research on these? Even if it's not something I do, it's specimens in our collection. But third, um, Jack actually mentioned this, but our data is now, uh, some disciplines have been pushed forward, but we're working towards it for all of the museum information, is available on some of these data aggregators that they've been talking about. So the global biodiversity information, I forget what the F is, <laughs> facility, I thought form. Uh, so those are some of the ways that we are sharing this data, so it is available, and hopefully it's influencing policy. Um, yes. Thanks, everybody. Any other questions? Yes. I'm Gavin. Now, the wall lizard, is there a predator for BC? Uh, they eat each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, they eat each other. Um, I've got a video out in the foyer. Uh, it's a male that's eating a lizard that's probably a third of his own size. Um, they were also, they're eaten by domestic cats, no surprise there. Uh, there's a guy from Sanitary who swears in Jack Russell Ferry and can catch hundreds a day. <laughs> House sparrows is a surprise. They will eat the young ones. Stellar jays, American robins, gulls, crows, raccoons. So most people complain they can't catch them because the lizards are so fast, but a bumbling raccoon can get them. And their secret is they get them at night. So when the lizards are under rocks and torpid, the raccoons are flipping the rocks and getting them while they're down. It's very, very clever. Um, and then I would suspect that sharp shinned hawks and cooper's hawks also are having a go at them. Uh, maybe even blue herons, because we are now finding wall lizard populations along the coast, especially in the Gordon Head. Uh, so yeah, there's a number of predators, but they're certainly not keeping up with the supply. Can I add four-year-old boys? <laughs> yeah. They're really fast. <laughs> and I'm going to take my fair share. I'll tell you that. Yes. I'm wondering if Heidi has heard back from the uh, commercial oyster farmers as to the costs involved and the uh, management challenges and whether there are eco friendliness issues in their management of the tourniquets. I think it. Nope, In case no one heard, the question was basically, have we had back and forth with the aquaculture industry? Um, yes, more directly fisheries and oceans has, that's more their mandate. But um, the thing that's interesting is these invasive certificates are um, affecting our aquaculture industry, but not to the same extent that they're seen on the east coast of Canada. And um, one of the species that's really prolific on the East Coast, it doesn't seem to be as prolific here. Um, 
we are getting feedback that it's also a bit more cyclical. Like they're finding that um, they're able to eradicate it um, or kind of deal with it one year and then it doesn't seem as bad the next year. Um, we, they, we also have had um, a bit of back and forth in the aquaculture industry about the colonial ones when there's multiple little individuals in it. If you break that off and spread it around, it can still reproduce. That's essentially just made it into five different colonies, if you get what I mean. So we've had back and forth with them about how to properly deal with their, their um, stock and their gear and stuff when it is fouled. And last but not least, um, on our coast, we do a lot more fin fish aquaculture than we do shellfish aquaculture, whereas the East Coast is a bit different. And so the fin fish aquaculture doesn't have the same impact as it does on the shellfish. Have I answered everything? There was a, another component I might have forgot. I was just wondering whether there is, is management leading to some um, positive or negative uses of it. Yes, so management has been helpful. Uh, even just um, getting them information booklets and informing them, like I said, about like these colonials, they need to be up out of the water, dried out, you can't just scrape it off and throw it back in the water. How to deal with it when it infest it is having some positive impacts. Um, but what's happening, why you're still seeing the spread happening along the coast, is that um, we're starting to have a lot of secondary spread by things such as um, recreational boats. So, it may have come into BC originally by some large vessel, but now it's getting spread around by like, you know, the little ducks and the boats and the marinas that work their way up the coast, or you know, that's probably how um, the Land Air Island happened. So even though we're having some success in the shellfish aquaculture, there's no way that these animals are gonna be completely eradicated. And like I said, we've started to see them in the natural habitat. So they're starting to have enough populations that they're making that little jump to the adjacent habitat. And um, their larvae are in the water column for a day or two, depending on the species. So they're also spreading by natural means now that they've established these populations. So we will no longer ever have complete eradication. I, I just wanted to, 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 to add a little bit to, to what Heidi said. Um, so in, 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 terms of, in, in terms of management, it, it's not always a straightforward one-to-one um, -one equation of finding invasive species or, you know, or even establishment of finding and controlling an invasive species. It's not often a one-to-one -one proposition because, because of, of uh, a phenomenon called um, the invasion lag. So what that, uh, what that means is that for, for many groups, for many groups, it, would, it, it, it may take um, a very long time. It may take many, many years from a style, uh, from from uh, introduction to possible establishment. So, and and, and subsequently, of course, of, of course, of course uh, detection. So it, it takes a it takes a long time sometimes for to even see what's happening. So you don't always know what's happening, and you don't always know the effects uh, simply because you can't see it or recognize it. One quick thing to add, for vertebrates, eradication is always possible. So uh, I can include one species as a, an example, and that's the passenger pigeon. So if we really wanted to put a concerted effort to eradication, we could do it. Sadly, in that case. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you to step back for a sec. Uh, I have a question that um, so far, uh, most of these, except for Rob's um, <coughs> examples, have been based on invasive species. But of course, as biologists, we, we also work uh, really closely with things that are native to the province. And since our, the, the panel and the, the session was talking about migration, I wonder if I can ask you to think about more broadly, outside of these specific examples, how, whether there's going to be particular losers in the climate change game as we go forward in the groups of animals that you work with, <laughs> or particular winners, um, that's also something we're thinking about. What's going to happen? Will plants and animals adapt to this change? Um, your thoughts on that, please. Well, considering I work on, I focus mostly on lower vertebrates, I think most of them, there's going to be a lot of winners. So reptiles will find more. If the climate does warm up, they, there will be north of expansion of reptiles. There's a lizard right on our border in Washington. It's the western fence lizard. It's also introduced in Puget Sound in, in Washington. Um, 
that species, I'm getting anecdotes from all over from all over South for the soy use. Uh, so that's that may already have made its own movement across the border. Uh, a student of mine found one, kept one for a summer. It's, West little, it's a little lizard, it's quite pretty. Uh, kept it for a summer and then released it again. Um, he didn't realize that he had a brand new species for Canada. But I think for fishes, the release and losers, some of the cool water fauna will either go die out or move north uh, in, in various drainages. Along the coast, I think what we'll see with climate warming is an increase in diversity. So fishes may move north to retreat from warm water, or they may go deeper, and then warmer water animals can move north. So the combined effect will actually be an increase uh, rather than a decrease. I think that, uh, that, that question in, 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 in the marine environment becomes even harder to, to, to answer. Because in order to answer that question, you first have to step back and, and ask yourself, what is what is a native species? Which which species are native? And that, that is not a simple question, because you know even even in trying to, to, to establish, for example, uh, in, in, in let's say my group uh, in the hydroids, right? Which, which 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 species are endemic? Well, you first have to then know. How many, you know, how many species did we find, let's say, along the west coast of, of North America? Okay, uh, so those questions have to be answered. And the other, the other thing that 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 taken uh, when I was taking account is that, in terms of marine species, we're always talking about. Um, yes, there, there are, as I mentioned, there 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 are temperature barriers and current and, and current um, uh, current gradients, for example. You know, those can start to constrain your distributions. Um, Quite a bit, but as always, when you're working, for example, within local habitats um, or along the region, you're working within this 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 gradient. A lot of my colleagues also have seen that when we're working uh, on on distributions of animals, is where do you draw the line? So in effect, some of that is arbitrary. So um, to answer some of those questions, we're still trying to, for different groups, for certain groups, at at that level, to establish. You know what is here, what has been here, uh, what might be here. You know before we can start answering those questions. That simply where we're at. It's it's not uniform uh, across the just uh, across the different taxonomic groups. I was going to say, are we going to get big man or jellyfish? Oh, can I follow up on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she just stole my answer. So as much as I agree with him know so little, we're still trying to learn so much, actually deep sea, we only know about, we've only explored about 3% of it, but in the ocean there is going to be some clear winners and some clear losers, so um, as the oceans are warming, they're actually getting more acidic, so anything with hard structures in them are going to be more likely to lose, and the things that don't have hard structures in them are more likely to win, so if you start seeing jellyfish everywhere, get scared, no, <laughs> so the jellies, the tuna kids, uh, are going to do really well. So that's to follow up. Yes, the oceans as they warm, you're going to see more of those animals doing well and thriving as opposed to the, or the animals that have no, or that have our exceptions. Well, I guess the simplistic way to look at it from uh, a, uh, an insect perspective is uh, if you live on a cold mountaintop somewhere, or even in the far north, um, you're going to be more in trouble than a grassland species, which uh, presumably uh, has a habitat that will increase with warming. Uh, if you're an aquatic insect, you may be in trouble because a lot of your habitats will dry up, unless you're an aquatic insect that's adapted to temporal ponds and, and it has a, a life history that allows you to live through long, dry periods. So, the worst possible thing to be in the insect world right now is probably a, a wingless insect on a mountaintop. Because not only is your mountaintop uh, arctic alpine habitat probably going to disappear, but you're not going to be able to move very fast to get to the next mountaintop further north to, uh, to keep going. So uh, that's a simplistic answer if you're only looking at how the broad climate warming is going to change uh, environments. Of course, a lot of these, a lot of these animals and plants, uh, their success or failure is going to do going, going to be uh, conditioned by 
how they react and interact to other plants and animals around them. And, and so there's a whole mosaic of different um, issues that they have to deal with rather than strictly uh, simply um, a warming temperature. So it's a complicated business. Thanks, everybody. And um, from the floor? Yes. Um, how much effort would it take uh, to produce a fairly comprehensive cataloging of uh, biodiversity in BC? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can answer that. I can answer that um, in part, OK? How much effort would it take? So we actually we actually tested that. So a couple of years ago, two years ago, actually we've been doing this several years since um, two or three years ago. So we did a we did a, um, a, a survey on Calvert Island, which is in the central coast here. And over a three week period, uh, my colleagues and I we collected um, sort of a bunch of biologists and, tax, uh, and taxonomists you know, from different groups. We went out and we collected as much as we could for three weeks. Um, we were focused, focused on the nearshore environment. So we went out and collected as much as we could in that three-week period. At the, at the end of the three-week period, uh, we went back, did, did all the preliminary um, field identifications on, 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 the, on the organisms we collected. Okay, And then we took that, right? And we took that and we compared that um, against known uh, known lists of of of, uh, of of organisms that, or lists of known organisms from uh, from from let's from the uh, uh, from the west coast. Okay, so we took a look at that. Now these are just what uh, known organisms. We compared it against that, and we found that we pretty consistently um, we're only able to achieve in a survey like that, for example, thirty percent of what is known. Now, the other side of that picture is we also found uh, a significant number of species that we did not know and we'd never seen before. So every time you go out, you still find, you find new species and you're finding, and I don't know why it's consistently at 30%, but that's what it worked out to, that we we're finding only about 30% of what was already known. Um, so that's... So to, so to put that in, in, in perspective, that you know, that's for one area, um, and, and, and some of the effort I'm involved in right now um, is mapping um, all along the west coast of North America. Now we we are we are um, um, coordinating with efforts for mapping the east coast of North America. Uh, where we're also coordinating, um, and a lot of us on it on on, uh, on these different teams as well. Uh, we're also coordinating with mapping, for example, in the Western Pacific. So, um, and, and, and to, to, to me, it's, it's a long-term, lifelong effort. Um, how hard would it be? Uh, a simple question, a simple answer to that would be very hard. Yeah, um, and to follow up sort of from um, an institutional perspective, that's kind of what we consider our job, or at least we're one of the team members that are working towards that job. And the collections that we have go directly into developing lists of species that occur in BC. And um, it really varies among different major groups of plants and animals. There are some groups of plants, for instance, that are fairly well known. We don't find new species um, very often at all. But invertebrates, um, insects for the terrestrial, and many, many groups for the, for the marine. Um, they're finding new things all the time. Claudia? I was going to say that Adolf and Linda Chesta have been surveying um, what we call Observatory Hill, but it's actually, it has a different name. But anyway, that little hill that the observatory is on for mushrooms, and they've been doing that for more than 10 years, and they're still finding new species, and they're well over 1,300 species. So that little hill for mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's because they've been going back every year. I think it was it once a month every year. I'm not month. sure their protocol, but it just blows my mind if you think about yeah. that one tiny discrete place. And what that what that um, argues for, and which we argue for all the time, is the temporal difference of when different species occur on the landscape and when you can actually detect them. So the seasonal differences. Um, so just by going out very regularly, Alina and Adolf found 
diversity that hasn't been seen. I don't think anywhere globally. Is that oh, the case? It's true. Globally, it's that, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering. Uh, it was just a sort of a follow-up question. Uh, uh, I don't know that the uh, gentleman in the tent suit. Uh, he was mentioning about three weeks intense um, collection. And I was just wondering about the seasons and how that would affect it, because uh, I, would just, I would suspect that this exact same location, if you do that three weeks, like say in August, it's very different from three weeks in February or three weeks in November. And, and of course, that's always a question of, uh, well, how much effort can you put in, because that tax takes people and equipment and time. And, you know, so how do you, I mean, how can you deal with that? Well, <laughs> so if, if, if I'm uh, if I'm hearing your question correctly, you're you're you're, you're talking about uh, you're asking about you know how do we account for seasonal changes? Um, how do we account for the practicalities of being able to do these surveys? And, and also how uh, and also the diversity the, the biodiversity changes with the season. So it's not just how do you account, but how can you even know unless you go there regularly? Like okay. So the thirty percent okay. might just be a yeah indication of that. Time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That that's a that's a, that's a good question. Though so the answer the answer to that is that we go out as much as we can whenever we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you're right. You're right. There. Is, you know. It, it, for example, uh, in, in example I mentioned, um, it could have been it could have been just within that three week period. We're, we're not we're not seeing certain things. Uh, so we, we try to we try to do we, we try to do these surveys, um, and you're right because for, for some for some studies, for example, uh, for some groups, for example, we know that there's not much work done in the winter simply because it's so unpleasant to go out then, right? So those are the kinds of things you have to account for. Uh, but we try to do as much as we can. Uh, now, for example, uh, in, in the Western Pacific, we're, we're not constrained so much. Uh, by by those kinds of seasonalities, although there are different kinds of seasonalities, and and uh, and how do, how do we account for what's happening, for example, in, in the Central Coast? Um, now we were we are by necessity able to go out there only in certain periods of the year, but uh, there is the Hakai Institute in Central Coast on Calvert Island, and they monitor uh, throughout the year. So you so we put all those kinds of data together. Uh, so how, how, so that that and that's why I say you know that's why I mentioned at the beginning we, we had only been uh, for for this example we had started to go out in the last few years and that's what we're finding and that's um, and I don't know I don't know if it's always going to remain at thirty percent but what we do know is that um, that um, we are finding a lot of things every time we go out we're finding a lot of things that we, that we've never seen before. So and again against this background of these these surveys, uh, there is also a background research that being done um, with with people from different groups really getting into those groups uh, throughout the year and seeing what's happening. So you put that data against the data we found, and you you get some answers that way. So so that that's not the only only means of inquiry that I'm talking about, but it, it's it's what we found and. Um, and, and then we put that against the work that other people. Collaborative uh, effort. That, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And we put all that together. Yeah. Casey. Um, on that note, I'm just curious if somebody wanted to comment on the role of citizen science. And um, I've participated in bio blitzes in the past, and you pair that with new technologies for uh, communicating and sending images and databasing. So I'm assuming that the rate of knowledge of these database expansions is astronomically increasing. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah, it is actually. Um, it's, it's easy for myself because most people can identify an American robin or a stellar chain or something like that. So uh, citizen science is really easy for the vertebrates. Uh, they also tend to be larger and more obvious. For insects, uh, it does take a special eye. And same with the marine invertebrates, freshwater invertebrates. So, uh, but yeah, it definitely is uh, building the database of biodiversity. Uh, KCD's websites that I talked about in my, my presentation uh, have made a really big difference to just the amount of information coming in on species distribution. The, the big problem in insect photography and insect identification on the internet is that uh, 
you can't always identify an insect for, uh, from its photo. Uh, there are so many different kinds, and so many look, so many look very similar to each other that uh, it's easy to make misidentifications. And so these these websites and, and all sorts of other websites that uh, aren't even posted for identification purposes are rife with misidentifications. It's a big problem. I mean, we all know that museum collections have, have piles and piles of specimens that are misidentified in them. So you can imagine what the photographic collections are like. So this is, this is one big problem that uh, you have to overcome, and sometimes you can't. You, you can't always identify these things to species level. Uh, but uh, more and more experts are getting involved in sort of moderating some of these photographic uh, collections online and, and uh, changing identifications and so on. And there's a big attempt to, to make, uh, make these more valid to uh, research in general. But it's a, it's very useful. I, uh, I, I recently did a, a major um, study on robber flies in Canada, and uh, I didn't get just use uh, specimens from collections. I, I went online and looked at all the, all the photographs I could and, and uh, got a number of new records for different provinces in Canada just from uh, photographs on the internet. So. Uh, if the photographs are good and if they're looking at the right parts of the insect body and so on, then you're okay. But uh, uh, it's still uh, a, uh, a valuable resource that's sort of in its infancy. I guess the only thing I can add is citizen science is a wonderful tool, especially for things in like bio blitzes, which is. You go to an area and a set amount of time with as many people and you just identify as many things as you can. These are very helpful for informing uh, local conservation groups or management areas. Um, but the thing I like about citizen science with the museums is it helps build our collections as well. So a lot of the time in the marine environment we get emails of, whoa, I just found this cool thing on the beach, what is it? And so sometimes we can answer that from photos, but we can't always. And so we're often by our you know, excited members. This is museums is the BC's uh, People's Museum. We invite them to like, if it's something really cool, bring it into the museum. And then that also serves as what we are. We are centers of taxonomic expertise. So unfortunately with invertebrates, a lot of times you can't tell things apart without looking at it under a microscope or having someone who's super knowledgeable in that area. So that's one of the things I like about citizen science is that beautiful pairing of what this museum should be. Yeah. So yeah. That's great. Any other questions from the Yes, uh, I actually have one thing to add in terms of citizen science. Um, maybe a little bit tangential to, to, to what um, um, we're, we're, we're talking about in terms of general citizen science. But um, I just wanted to add this because I think it, it's pretty. There's a there's a there's a special um, in terms of citizen science. There there's a special group of citizen scientists that uh, are often overlooked, and that's people who are actually either working with, with these groups in their daily life, like the uh, uh, people who, who fish, for example, uh, or, or people who are um, involved in, in, in these groups for their living. And th those, are, those are pretty important sources of knowledge that, that we sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we, we sometimes overlook. Now, uh, just, just a quick example of that. Um, I don't know if many of you will remem remember on days before plastic, you have, um, you have these Christmas wreaths that are made from marina, uh, that are actually made from hydroids, right? They, they wouldn't call hydroids, right? In, 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 when, they, when they sell them, they don't call them hydroids. Uh, and for, I forget what the common name is, like uh, some kind of seagrass, although it's not seagrass. So hydroids were collected at one point uh, and this is in the UK, uh, they were collected and they were dry and, and dyed green and made into wreaths. Okay. Now the people who were collecting these hydroids, there's a, there's, a, there's a group of hydroids called Sertularia, and there were, in this group there were a couple of species that were collected and made into these wreaths. Now at the time that, you know, uh, at one time they were known that they were two species and that people who were collecting, collecting kept, kept saying, well, you know, they're very, they're very different, and I can see a difference in colony. 
uh, in the colony form and shape. That, although they didn't put it in those terms, but they, 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 they said, look, they're different. Um, and the people who were working on them, I had those own people like myself, who were saying, well, sure, you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the expert here. And there's only one species. Well, it turns out they were right. Right? In that case, there were two species. And it's, it's often difficult to articulate the differences in groups, in, in species, because sometimes they look very much like and they differ in, in very, very simple, in very, um, excuse me, in, in just a few, a, few, a few things that can be hard to spot. But that's what happened. So that's a historical example of, you know, they didn't call it citizen science back then, but that's a historical example. It, it, it's important to listen. Um, to, to listen and consider your information from all sources. That's a great example. The one last thing about citizen science is that uh, there's, like, if, it, if we were just looking at the four of us here up front, we've got eight, how many eyes? Eight? Yeah. Um, citizen science gives way more eyes on the ground, even if they're not 100% sure of what animal like, they're seeing or plant or, or mushroom. But to have those extra eyes out there means a uh, much greater chance of detection of anything new, anything different. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. So you basically focused on trying to answer the question what exists in a certain area, what animals, what species are there. To some extent, you uh, talked a little bit about where might they come from, what might be their future fate in uh, climate change. I'm interested to hear from you what you think other important research questions are, apart from what is there, where do they come from, what might happen. What, what are sort of other fundamental research questions in your domain that are really important? Do you want to repeat that question a little bit? Um, so the other fundamental questions are that can stem from our work. Um, partly from my, for the wall lizard research, um, it's being, it's, it's direct, drawing attention because it's applicable elsewhere. So, um, so the invasion here is now being used uh, as, a, as a test case for invasions elsewhere. So uh, we do have that sort of global relevance. And uh, yeah, I've got colleagues in England now coming here to compare impacts of the lizards here on our native species to compare with the sand lizard in England. So it's kind of neat to have that, that international collaboration. So the so the the, the, the you know the, the, the addressing the problem where they are and where they're from is so it's the basis of everything that one has to do in order to answer the higher level questions. So in terms of in terms of hybrid zones, for example, um, we need to know that because we need to know the distributions. And the reason that we need to have an idea of, of what the distributions are. Um, it's because, uh, for example, in different areas of the globe, uh, the same species are often uh, are often put together. Uh, oh, sorry, different species are often put together in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a single species complex. And then on the on the other side of it, for hydrozoans, for example, uh, lots of times animals that look very much the same, species that look ex almost exactly the same, uh, are, are actually they actually turn out to be very different. And some of these uh, some of these differences uh, are only apparent uh, genetically. Um, so we take fit that together with the morphological information. So then under and, and so so on top of that, why are we why are we interested in all these uh, in, 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 you know using those kinds of questions? What are the kind of higher higher level questions we can answer? Uh, one of the things that we are interested in with higher zones and with all this uh, talk about uh, transport and how they survive under adverse conditions, for example. How they spread. Uh, hydrozoans in, in their life cycle, okay, they have a they have a very interesting trait. Um, so uh, I should use the word trait. They have, they have a very interesting characteristic. Um, in in that a lot of them have a two stage life cycle in which they look quite different, right? You have your pollen and you have a jellyfish like stage. Now, under adverse conditions, now normally. So, so under adverse conditions, um, in, 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 in one group, for example, uh, the the hydrozone or the hybrid can the hydrozone can actually revert back from a jelly form to a polyp form. That's not usually the way it goes. Um, so that so in, in terms of, of of those types of characteristics, 
So we're interested in how uh, that helps us to understand, for example, uh, how the cells regenerate. Um, because in, in that instance, it's, it's theoretically possible uh, for that hydrosome, unless it's actually physically destroyed, to live forever. So what does that mean in terms of cell regeneration? We, uh, lizards can grow their tails, we grow their tails, but they can't generate a whole new lizard, for example, right? These guys can. Now, in order to sort out those questions, um, we first have to know, well, are we looking at the same species? So if not, then you have different species um, exhibiting that. When did that, uh, when was that uh, ability acquired, for example, uh, through evolution? So to answer those kinds of questions, we always try to get to those kinds of questions um, by first. In order to answer those kinds of questions effectively, uh, we really have to be able to also ask the question, the very basic question of what and where, because they don't come with labels. So that, that's just one example. I think, uh, in my perspective, uh, the most important bigger picture research questions uh, for museum biologists um, are the elucidation of the phylogenetics of groups of organisms. In other words, how do they evolve and uh, how they're related and those kinds of questions that fit all organism, or all organisms into the, the bigger picture of uh, biodiversity. So, phylogenetic systematics and the elucidation of the evolutionary relationships uh, through morphology, genetics, uh, zoogeography, biogeography, those kinds of bigger questions are the, the uh, most important questions that uh, collection-based research can answer. I keep going last, so I have to build on everyone. <laughs> They've had great answers. Um, well, I think the important thing about museums and what we do is this is essentially the, the backbone of biodiversity science. You need to have a name on something to then be able to ask all those questions. So what questions we can ask? We can ask any question now that we know this. So who eats it? What eats it? How did it get here? How did it evolve here? Um, just, that's what I like. It's like you can't understand any of these other questions without knowing you know that these two things are different or that this has this name. And uh, to, to even take it that step farther, like if you have to um, consider all the questions you can ask, you can even ask all these questions about how do these, knowing these animals, benefit humans? Let's go there. Why not? And put that spin on it. For example, off of the west coast of BC, we have hydrothermal vents. This is um, deep sea, underwater volcanoes, where we described and found new species that were not known in the world. And we can now do more DNA research and medical research that benefits humans because of um, enzymes that they found down at these places. So I hope that answers it a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you were asking what specific questions our, question, our research can answer, but just the idea of biodiversity science, it's, it's the, yeah. yeah. Can I follow up just quickly on um, that and then before that, Rob's um, uh, ideas about that understanding how um, life evolved, the relationships among organisms. Um, not only do we look at that tree and say, oh, here's how they all related, but at that point then we can also start to understand the processes that um, gave us those trees. So then we start talking about Darwin's theory of natural selection and what drives biodiversity in different parts of the world. Why are the um, tropics so diverse? Why is British Columbia relatively not diverse? Um, so we, we feed into that those questions about how evolution actually works. I was also wondering that um, understanding what species are here, what species are moving in, what species are moving out, uh, it feeds into the bigger question of what will survive us. And the things that do well, do well around humans, and they're spreading as a result of this uh, Anthropocene, homogeneity, whatever you want to call this period. Uh, so it will also allow us to make bigger predictions about what this planet will look like in 100 years, or in 200 years, or when we're extinct. What will survive us, and that's the things that could have tolerated us. And then when we're gone, what's going to happen? So it, it's, it could be fun, a fundamental exercise. Anything else on the floor? That's been a really, oh, something from Leah. Uh, I will not ask in favor of 
<laughs> Something else did you have in mind that uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I was wondering about how does this fit in with, uh, I guess, uh, paleontology? Yeah. Or even just a hundred year old or two hundred year old specimens of eggs or spores or uh, to basically just to map what 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 was here and still is here or isn't here anymore or maybe five hundred years, you know, sort of because there are things like these weather patterns like the uh, Pacific decadal oscillation and they're multi decadal. So if you just compare things you know, like twenty years or maybe fifty years, maybe there's other oscillations that are multi-century, you know, uh, that we haven't really detected. So, like, what, uh, have you sort of looked at how to try to get, well, spores or eggs or anything else that might be preserved that are several hundred or several thousand years old? Or, you know, sort of like in between the paleontological, which is where they're um, turned into rock, preserved in rock, not quite at that stage, but still older than our living memory. Uh, Richard Hadley should be here. He retired. Uh, he worked on pollen uh, samples. Oh, yeah. through, you know, so so that, that sort of yeah. length of history of looking at cycles of uh, plant yeah. presence through time, yeah, that, that stuff is one of the hallmarks of museum science, that mm -hmm. we preserve geographically, taxonomically, and year by year as best we can. Uh, and with core samples, uh, yeah, you, you can. The, uh, record that material and then observe patterns or detect them. Yeah. Uh, I, I should also say that that um, in terms of capturing uh, evolution through time, um, so uh, well, first of all, let, let me just clarify something. Um, in terms of, you mentioned 20, 30 years back, I think in, in, in museums, we're, we're in the business of going back um, you know, in terms of let's say wet collections, uh, just just mm -hmm. just in terms of wet collections, we're we're, we're able to go back you know, at least two hundred years, for okay. example. Well, that is not uh, in evolutionary terms. That's not a significant amount of time. Amount of time that's within our lifetimes. Yeah. Okay. So the other the other part of uh, the other the other part of my answer to your question, for example, uh, well, the other part of my answer to your question, um, how how do we capture this evolutionary time? Uh, then going back to Nigerians um, and, 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 and yeah. other such groups, because that's what I do. Uh, we can, for example, look at uh, when different, and I started to talk about this early, when different traits were acquired um, mm -hmm. in different groups. And we're able to do that and extrapolate back to when we think um, uh, this occurred, for example. So through evolution, evolutionary type, for example, uh, we can look at things like um, when was the you know, when was the central nervous system acquired? How yeah. many times was it acquired and reacquired? Uh, how, what was the timing of, 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 of this? Um, so we know, uh, for example, now that, that um, you know, a lot of traits were not acquired just once. That evolution happened uh, multiple times in multiple groups. Uh, and when we look at uh, Nigerians, for example, well, when did the third tissue layer develop um, in Nigerians? And how, how, how do we uh, how, how do we, for example, lay everything out in evolutionary terms? Uh, so those, those are, that's another way in which we're capturing, uh, and when we put that together with the, the paleontological information, that we're able to go back millions of years, um, you know, to, to, to start to answer those kinds of questions. Uh, the RBCM does have a really, really good paleontolog paleontological collection. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, most of the research uh, uh, in the past, has been done on uh, plants and vertebrates, but we now have a vertebrate paleontologist, uh, Victoria, here now, and uh, so that's that's wonderful. Um, I, I should say that the habitats and environment of the interior, southern interior parts of British Columbia in the Eocene, say 50 million years ago, are relatively well known relatively well known, not really well known, but through the work of uh, Bruce Archibald, who's a research associate here. Um, and he and I have been working on uh, the dragonflies of that era. And uh, I can tell you that um, none of the species that we uh, have come across from 50 million years ago in the interior of British Columbia, or what is now the interior of British Columbia, 
uh, occur today. So there, all those, all those dragonflies and damselflies um, at the species level and the genus level are extinct. Uh, they're 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 the family. Although the, the largest family of dragonflies we have around here in British Columbia today hadn't even evolved then, fifty million years ago, it didn't exist anywhere in the world. So, so uh, there are significant changes that we have documented in in, uh, in the long distant history of British Columbia. You're not a dead anything yet, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and please come back tomorrow when um, Victoria will be presenting on her upcoming research. Um, I have a question for Gavin. Did you change the logo for today? <laughs> you caught that, did you? Yeah. It invaded in there. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Any more questions before we give Leah a chance? Yeah. I just wanted to uh, remind you that we do have um, afternoon sessions starting at 1 o'clock. And between now and 1 o'clock, there are what we're calling engagement tables in Clifford Carl Hall. And that's where you can actually meet some of these speakers in person and continue to ask your really uh, interesting questions and see some of their research firsthand. We'll see you here at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait, I didn't think we were going to make this one again. Just slides for this afternoon. Are they loaded? I don't know. Leah, slides for this afternoon. Hi, Lily. Yes. Yeah, no, that's what I'm going to be working on over lunch. <laughs> Very sorry. I... No, I can't believe I.